Hello, everyone, and good morning. I'm Rebecca, the head of community at Common Room, which is the community intelligence platform that helps you build better products, deepen relationships, and grow faster. You can hang out with more than 800 community leaders and community builders in our Uncommon community Slack. You can find out more about that at commonroom.io slash uncommon. Um, and you can learn more about Common Room itself, the SaaS product behind the magic at commonroom.io. Before we dive in with Richard, our special guest, author of three very indispensable books at building communities around based on building communities, um, a few quick notes. So first, my teammates and fellow community builders, Stephen and Zara, will be keeping an eye on the chat, answering and collecting questions along the way and ensuring a safe and respectful space. So three cheers for Stephen and Zara who are behind the scenes, but making sure that so much of this can happen for all of us that are gathered here and to make sure our special guest has a great experience as well. Um, and then second, the music you heard while walking in was Bijinho by a Brazilian artist, Duda Beat. Um, it also happens to be the newest song added to the collaborative Uncommon Tunage community playlist on Spotify. Steven's gonna put the link in the chat. We invite all community builders to add the songs that they love to work to. Um, it was also the song that we wrote our latest community newsletter to. And sweet fun fact, Bijinho is a term of affection for someone you love, something akin to like sweetheart um, in English. So it seemed quite fitting to use it as our walking song today. All right, so one of our core missions as a host of the Uncommon Community for Common Room is to empower community leaders with knowledge around community building strategies, best practices, and connections to other experts to share ideas and outcomes. So in that spirit, we're extremely excited to host this author Q&A with Richard Millington. He is the co-author, not the co-author, he is the author of Build Your Community as well as the indispensable community and buzzing communities. And he's the co-founder of Feverbee, which is a community consultancy that uses proven social science to help organizations build thriving communities around the world. That's a lot. I just said a lot. Let's get right to it. Hi, Richard. Welcome. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Um, I don't know who I co-founded Feverbee with, but I'd like to meet that person. Oh, wow. I am so sorry that I like reread my notes like six times and somehow said co-founder twice. Oh, I, I missed it as well. Um, how's it going? <laughs> it's going really well. And I appreciate you um, fixing that for me. And I'll make sure that's fixed everywhere else. Um, so, whoa, Feverbee, the consultancy that you founded on your own, uh, not as a co-founder, but that you've put your blood, sweat, tears, effort, work and um just straight brilliance into you for over the last 10 years. It's a treasure <laughs> chest of resources from blog posts and videos focused on community building strategies. And you like highlight gotchas and other things that, you, that you've seen haven't worked. Um, and you also offer community management courses focused on learning the fundamentals of community building to the innards of psychological influence in communities. Like you cover the whole spectrum of like soft science, hard science and everything in between. Will you tell us a bit about what you've built at Fever B across the past decade and how it's resonating with folks today? Yeah, I don't, speak, don't think I can speak to how it's resonating with folks. I guess I need the folks to say that. Um, I think what Fever B does is try to take community building out of the digital dark ages of guessing what works and hoping what works and turning it into a more predictable science. There's always going to be a kind of art about it. But what interests me is how indispensable the data is, how indispensable it is to understand the basic principles of psychology, how indispensable it is to prove the value of a community. And what Phoebe does is help many of the world's largest organizations develop successful communities of customers, employees, fans. And we do that through strategies, through helping them design a community um, and, and training as well. And honestly, what we find is that so many of the practices haven't really evolved from when like a webmaster would create a community and then try to get people engaged and participating. And so we try to really seal in that space um, of bringing it into a modern approach, a more scientific approach, and really achieve the best results for clients that we um, possibly can. I appreciate that you're like, hey, we need to ask our clients and people who are working with Vierby, like how it's resonating with them. but. I would, I will make the mental leap to say that you've worked with over 300, I think maybe 320 now, like organizations across wide ranges of industries and spectrums and community sizes. So I will just like go ahead and make that leap that it's, it's, it's <laughs> quite well. <laughs> um, I think, yeah, I think there's a 
great need right now to build online communities that are built upon data, built upon psychology, and aren't guesswork. I think that's what's resonating really strong, strongly. I would agree, uh, or I will I will follow that thread with, with you. And before we dive into book-based questions, and I think in your book, right, this latest one, Build Your Community, you dive into more of those, like, there's like specific moments that you can say like, hey, here's a here's concrete examples and like, no, get, taking the guesswork out of it. Before we dive into those questions, um, can you tell us about the book that we'll be discussing today, which is Build Your Community? And then there are two others that came before it, the Indispensable Community and Buzzing Communities. So what does Build Your Community focus on that sets it apart? Or what does it build upon um, from the foundations of your two previous books? And what, what compelled you to write this one now? Yeah, um, well, let's go back to the first book, Buzzing Communities. I wrote that because there wasn't really a good guide to building a community. Everyone at the time wanted to create a community and get a lot of engagement in that community. And that is what that's for. Um, and then the indispensable community came at a time when people were questioning, what is the value of having a community? Like, great, it's, have, it's great to have all that engagement and all that participation, all those members are actively participating, but what does it mean for a business? What does it mean for an organization? What's the value of that? So it's very much about once you've got all this engagement, what do you do with it? This one is more about the uh, playbook of how you do it well. Um, at the moment, a lot of the techniques that used to work a decade ago don't work anymore. There's been a saturation of people. Once they find one thing that works, everyone tends to use that same tactic. And even if it was good initially, it doesn't really sustain things over the long term. And what Build Your Community is, is a very data-driven guide of how to build a community in the modern era. Because things have changed. A lot of the things that worked before don't work today. A lot of the ways that we create discussions, create content, engage with social me media and forums and other channels, they don't work as well um, um, as what they used to. And so we need a new guide and we need a new approach and we need a data-driven and psychology-driven approach. And that's what Build Your Community is. It's a book that'll take you step-by-step step through the process of developing a community based upon a whole wide range of examples and evidence and proof and all the things that hopefully uh, will resonate with some of the people that are uh, watching here today. Cool, so let's start out at the beginning. And I'm curious to see, I think, as, yeah, as you say that process, there's there are moments of that process where they're foundational and they are apply across years. And there are probably moments where you're like, now we know something different or people are building in different ways. And so this is what has changed over the last 10 years. Um, so let's dive in from the beginning. And I was trying to figure out where to start in terms of this live author Q&A, but luckily per usual, community members pre-submitted questions when they registered uh, that they wanted to get your take on. And so I thought this was a great place to start because it's truly starting from the beginning. So Elena at Fiberplane had asked, how do I grow a community from zero? And to help set up this question in your book, I think you break down like really excellent firsts. Um, chapter three discusses creating your community experience, Chapter four is about setting the rules and chapter five is about attracting your first member. So it's like that pre pre work and then pre work and then putting it out into the world and attracting your first members. So I think all of those play a super strong hand toward Elena's question. So from the top, beginning with chapter three, 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 creating your community experience in it, you focus on the idea of creating home for your community and you start by distinguishing community platform from community website. So we'll get into platforms a bit later, but when it comes to websites, what makes a great one? And what are some ways to analyze and improve existing ones? Inspired, spoiler, by a recent blog post that you wrote that was super, really, super, really good <laughs> called Why Most Community Homepages Are Terrible and How to Get Yours Right. So what does that home look like? How to start? And then let's get into like attracting your members. Yeah, um, let me re reorganize a bit in a way that makes more Please sense in my do. head. Um, a lot of people focus on how to do it instead of why they should do it. And before you even do anything else, you have to answer the question, why am I doing it? And that sounds like it's a really obvious question. I'm doing it because, I don't know, I want to reduce support costs. So I just want a lot of people talking to each other and sharing information. But you have to be very clear about why, because there's different types of community. If you're building a community based around support, where people come, they ask a question, and then, then they leave, that's a completely different model and set of challenges that you need to solve than if you're building a small peer group of people to engage with one another and feel a sense of belonging. And there's different models, and there's a blog post I read about this um, a couple of weeks ago, but there's different models you can follow. 
And until you answer that, why you're doing it really specifically, like if it's working, what difference will you see in your life? Until you answer the why, you can't really proceed to the how. But I know everyone's going to skip past that and just what's the how of what are the tactics to make a community right. So on the community experience side, there's so many steps here to get right. Um, so let me focus on one of the big ones. First, know what your budget is. First, make a projection of how many members you're likely to have, because a lot of platforms will charge you by the number of members you're likely to have. And then be clear about how your members engage with each other today. Um, for a community experience to succeed, there has to be a reason for people to visit that community. And where people go wrong and they end up creating a ghost town is that they assume that if they create a new um, website or a new experience that people would naturally visit it because they want a community. And the reality is they don't. Um, the reality is most people aren't looking for a new community in their lives. Some might be, but what they are looking is to solve challenges they have and to improve themselves in some way. Um, and these are kind of the draws that get people to visit a, um, any website at all. And so the challenge before you select your platform, before you build the community experience, is to figure out what is gonna be the draw to get people to visit that community in the first place. Because again, a support community, there's always a reason for people to visit that, they need support. If you're trying to build a sense of belonging, that's different. So go with the models that are actually working. So when I wrote a post about why homepages are terrible at the moment, is because they're not satisfying the needs of the people that come to visit the community. What happens again and again, I think I use Sony as an example of what not to do, my apologies to them, I had to pick on someone, um, is that they think that people come to a community because they want to be part of a community. They come to a community because they want to solve a problem they have or to seize an opportunity that is out there today. Um, and sometimes a sense of belonging, but that's quite rare. So the first step is to do that. Um, figure out really specifically what is the best platform for what you're trying to achieve. <coughs> so I have a bad cold today. Um, once you have that, getting your first members, and by the way, like your budget is going to determine so much of this. If you've got a budget of say more than a hundred grand to spend, you're probably going to go with um, Chorus or Salesforce or Intelligent or Insided, uh, Vanilla, one of those platforms. If you're at the 10K to the hunt to the hunt the hundred K level, you're probably going to go with maybe Vanilla, Discourse, one of those kinds of uh, form-based platforms that are out there, maybe Hybrid as well. And if you're below that, you're probably looking at Circle, Tribe, uh, Mighty Net, 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 Network for a few hundred dollars. And then there's free platforms like Facebook. Um, what's the second part to that question? Um, setting the rules, creating experience. Um, so creating a home and then this idea of like establishing platform from website. But what does it mean to okay. create a home for the pre-work before you actually attract your first members? So... Obviously, a platform is different from, from a website. Like um, one platform can host many different kinds of communities. And what you usually, if you're not using Facebook or a tool like that, what you're essentially doing is buying the right to license the use of that platform for a period of time. And they're usually charged by the number of members that you're expected to get. That's a pretty critical part of this. And a platform is, sim is simply like Chorus, like Salesforce, um, like Zoom. You know, there's many different um, meetings that are taking place on Zoom. Um, it's the same thing. That's basically what we mean by a platform compared to a community website. A website is hosted on the platform. Um, your question about a home. Um, every community needs a home. Um, and that's why a mailing list can work, but usually you need something that's a little bit more than that. So Facebook groups can be a home. Um, your, you can create a dedicated homepage just for that. Um, but you need some kind of home. Um, this is why Slack often works well in internal communities. It's not really a replacement for your inbox or your, you know, the e emails you're getting every single day. What it is, is that it's the soul of your company. If you're not meeting in person anymore, then Slack is that soul of your business. Cool. So let's go from building from zero and where Elena's from Fiber Plane inspired this question, right? Like, how do we go from zero? Now we have some sort of home hosted on a platform. So now let's talk about the importance of setting the rules before you attract those first members. So in chapter four, you discuss three specific areas of rules. You're like unique social norms, universal rules, and judgment calls. I think there's quite a distinction between these and that without having guidelines around what people mean by these and at least internally knowing what that is, 
Um, you're going to run into like frictional, like confusion between how you treat certain situations or not. So will you describe each of these and then how they apply to setting up a successful community um, and some of the ongoing maintenance people should be aware of? Yeah, there's two very specific parts to this. One um, is how you keep members in your community safe and give them the environment where they feel comfortable engaging with one another. And this is usually based around the universal rules. Um, so obviously you don't want um, sexism, home, homophobia, all of those kind of things. That is an, um, a default position, I think, for most of us today. We don't want any of that. Um, so those rules are usually pretty simple to create. They're more difficult to enforce because you have to define what those things are in a practical sense, but those are like the borderline foundation. Um, and then you have what we call the cultural creating rules, which is the unique social norms. There's a great book by Priya, Priya Parker called The Art of the Gathering, which is one of the most fantastic books that you should read. Um, everyone in this call should I read. And what she describes is that you can create unique rules that prompt people to engage in a different way. And so she's hosted a groups for like mums where you're not allowed to talk about your kids or like um, events where the first person to check their phone, uh, check their phone, like has to pay the bill. Um, and what you get is that you knock people out of a certain routine they have, and then they can begin engaging in a more honest, authentic and incredibly like memorable way. So there's so many unique norms that you can have within a community. You might have a community where people aren't allowed to share an opinion but they can share research and data with one another. And that's going to create a very different kind of community experience than one if you want only off topic discussions and activities. It's a different community if people are allowed to use their, their real names or are forced to use their real names than if they're not allowed to use their real names. Um, and so I think very carefully is what are the unique rules that are going to make your community different from anything else out there? Like you have such, often you don't get to decide like the platform that you want. Often you can't decide so many other things, but the unique social norms you, you create, you get to decide this. You get to decide what's going to be a remarkable experience for your members. And if you go to the edge with this, you can create a culture that's unlike anything else. Like there's great Reddit sites like um, Change My Mind or Change My View, I think it's called. Like fantastic sites, but it's a very unique social norm. Someone will post something and someone has to argue against it. And that creates a unique experience. There's another called Am I Being the asshole again completely based where someone shares what they've done and people get to judge whether they are being an ass or not and these unique norms create these amazing experiences where people can engage in a different way often a more entertaining way and also in a way that allows people to have discussions they can't have anywhere else so that's what we mean by these unique social norms and then we have the difficult part the judgment calls <laughs> Judgment calls are the things that get a lot of communities into trouble when they don't mean to, because there's no right answer. So if you tell people that they can use, um, um, that they have to use their real, their, real, their real names, that's fine. But what if their real names include characters that your system doesn't allow? That happens, that happens very often. Um, what if they change their name and the system doesn't allow it? There's issues with that. Or if you tell people they can use any pseudonym that they want, are you happy with a member joining with the name Trump Fan 69? Like, is that like the name of a user that you want in your community? I do you want people in your community with an image that says Black Lives Matter or Blue Lives Matter or All Lives Matter? Like these are judgment calls where it's very difficult to make. Um, but again, you have to fig to figure out where on that continuum you want your community to be. Do you lean more towards that freedom of speech side or do you lean more towards that like um, safe environment where people aren't going to be threatened um, or feel uncomfortable? And there's no right answer, but there's a trade-off in each one. Um, and it's about making sure that everything aligns for that. Hopefully that makes sense. It totally makes sense. I'm wondering if I can um, pull on that a little bit more. So I'm sure you can't name the companies that you worked with, but I'm sure that many companies have had these internal discussions and you've probably helped either guide them through that or um, been a thought partner in that. Have you seen any any that have been very successful in terms of they've come to an agreement and feel really good about how they're going to treat judgment calls versus uh, others that weren't as successful and any like patterns between what enables teams and internal teams to get to a, a place that they all feel 
aligned about and then other tactics that maybe haven't because I bet a lot of people are probably like we're going to have to make those calls and so I'm wondering if you could share anything about things that you've seen successful in helping teams make those calls yeah I can think of an example not too long ago where someone made a judgment call about a pseudonym in a community and that member sent a message to the CEO of the organization um telling what a bad community manager this woman was and with all examples of people being annoyed by the judgment calls that she had made. And so things like that happen. It's very sad that it happens, but with judgment calls, you're going to get people that are upset. I think for an organization, there are brand guidelines in place and that's usually the best place to begin. Like brands have an idea of the tone of voice that they want to use, the image they want to project in a certain environment. And if you're in a community that's created by a brand, then the judgment call should reflect that. Um, and some brands are fun, some are irreverent, some are very formal and official. Um, so the brand guidelines are usually a good place to begin. And then if you want the judgment calls to be good, you need someone with good judgment in the first place. Um, and that means recognizing that the more rules you have, the more you time and investment you have to make in, in enforcing the rules. So you can create all the rules you want, but if no one's going to enforce them, that's an issue. Um, and so I don't think there's a single way of doing it. There's some organizations that I think have good rules in place. I think SAP, for example, have pretty good rules in place. Um, but the majority are taking it on a case-by-case -case basis. They have someone that they trust to make the judgment calls out in the best interest of the brand. Uh, something that really understands like where the brand is positioning themselves and someone that understands the trade-offs of that. Um, there's no easy way of doing it, but just be mindful, um, be really mindful that whatever you do, people aren't going to be happy with some of the decisions that you make. Um, and also one thing I would add is that very often people will remove an item of content and then, um, I, let, me, let me throw them in here. Like, I think when you're enforcing a rule, there should be no exceptions to that rule. Either you change the rule or you remove it. So there shouldn't be an exception to the rule of why you remove something on one particular situation because that shouldn't happen. Your rule should cover it. So it means you need a new rule to cover that situation. Um, and so when a judgment call do does arise, you might have to create a new rule for it. So you're not just doing it once, but you're doing it consistently going, going forward. I should probably double down on the fact that you're like, it's, none of it's actually going to be easy. And it's like, that is true. None of it's going to be easy. We can have, we can get all of your knowledge possible, but putting it into action is like, it's not going to be easy and that's okay. Like that's just where we should start from. Um, all right. I so think, I'll just add to that. If you think about um, Facebook, for, for example, Facebook have had rules on their site since the beginning, but it's the enforcement of that rules. That's really, really difficult. Um, and so how do you enforce what, how people name themselves you know how do you enforce um what images people share like it would make sense to almost everyone that any child porn you should remove from a community right that would be a default thing but what about that one image from the v from the vietnam war that has a very you know notable aspect to it so like it's so difficult to do this in a consistent way it's so difficult and i have so much sympathy for the people doing that work sorry i interrupted you no, I um you are our guest. I thank you for continuing. <laughs> um I think you actually bring up that example in your book. I read a couple of your books, all three really. So <laughs> then I was like, is this example in that book? I think it is in Build Your Community though. I think I think you touch on it. Um all right, cool. So now we have like we have home and now we are setting up the rules and guidelines where first members and members going forward um will abide by or the way that we'll enforce or like establish consistency. So Elena Fiberplane is now starting her community from zero and she has her home established and now she in a rule set and now she wants to attract her first members. So in chapter five, you talk about things like identifying and inviting your founding members. You also talk about strategies for launching a community at a big event, which I think could be applied in more general terms, like creating questions for speakers in the community, arranging meetups with others, posting new questions from customer support in the community to start to like get a little bit of that engagement going, running a live ideas jam session. So a lot of things that you talk about. Can you dive into a few examples that you love from organizations who have attracted their first members in a way that you think others should try to repeat? Yeah, it depends on the type of community that you're developing. Like a customer support com community, 
you don't need to do as much foundational work because you've got so many people with questions that need answers. If you're doing any other kind, then usually you need to seed the community with members and activity and a sense of culture before you begin. And that often begins one to three months be before you launch. Um, and so some very sp uh, specific things I do here. It's one, I'd create a criteria for the kinds of activities you want people to do. So founding members are fantastic. They're people that are helping to get the community off the ground, get it going, get it growing, um, these kind of things. Um, they're usually people that you have strong relationships with already, or people that have shown a certain enthusiasm for the work that they're doing. Um, and then if you're building a peer group or a smaller group, then there's a lot of direct invitations to, me to, to, mem to members. Um, building relationships up. So before you launch, you've got a big list of people that you can reach out to to join, do individual invites to get to maybe 100 mem members first and then scale beyond that. So we're doing one project with an organization called USP, uh, United States Pharmacopoeia, where they followed this so well. They began by doing all of the interviews uh, with members of their target audience, like, sci like, a sci like scientists in really specific fields. Um, we identified some found some founding members. We invited them to a workshop to tell us what kind of community they wanted and collaborate with a whiteboard or mural to really try and design um, what that experience is going to be like. And then um, we began doing more promotion on LinkedIn. We began doing promotion on Twitter. I found LinkedIn, especially for a professional community, it's fantastic. You can identify exactly the kinds of members you want. You can identify exactly the kind of people interested in your topic. And so that kind of content has really helped them grow. It's always going to be small, but they are steadily growing um, for over a year now. And it's been quite exciting to see their success and see the results that they've achieved. Um, what other examples do you like? Um, Kaggle, K-A-G-G-L-E. Um, I interviewed them for my, my, my second book. And this is a community for data, sci data scientists. Um, I think it was acquired by Google um, a few years ago. Um, but when he was just launching this, what he did was went to all of the events where other people were showing up, where other data scientists were showing up and he spoke to them, he built relationships and he gradually got more and more people to join his site and use that site. He did a competition there that generated some activity and grew steadily from, from that. So fundamentally, at the very beginning, you've got to do the things that don't scale well. For support, it's a bit different, but for most other kinds of communities, you need to really work like crazy to get a few dozen active members first before trying to get a thousand members. Like the biggest mistake is to have this big launch and try and get a thousand or 10,000 people to visit on the first day. That doesn't work at all because all these people are having this awful first impression. What does work is really going into the weeds, getting a few dozen active mem mem members first, and then steadily growing from there. To find your, found your founding members, give them genuine things to do. Like if they're a founding member, they want to do actual work. This isn't just like a rubber stamping thing. Um, give them discussions to create topics they're in charge of. Put them in charge of, of recruitment, if you like. Give them really unique and in engaging roles, and then let them run with it. Ooh, I think this is actually going to like leapfrog a little bit. So I'll like leapfrog and then we can come back. But um, it sounds like that's a little bit of, um, what do you say? It's not a reward. It's like, um, it's not even a carrot. It's just like that acknowledgement of them being a founding member, right? What are some of those uh, tactics, right? What are some of those jobs that founding members really feel engaged by and like, uh, and, and appreciated by being offered? Like, have you seen certain ones where people are like, I love being able or being asked to do this job. This feels great. Let me talk about the flip side of that first. Like um, if you volunteer um, for, a for a charity or, or something like that, you want to do things that matter, right? You like, you want to feel like that you mattered. Um, and so the mistake that is often made is that people don't have any tasks for like their founding members to do. And that passion is quickly lost like volunteers they want to help they want to be in like the soup kitchens or whatever they want to do often the most difficult task because that's what gives them the greatest sense of satisfaction and founding members of the set are the same they want to feel that sense of influence and importance so you can consult them on web design you can give them input on how they think the site should be designed you could put them in charge of creating content for a particular topic in that community as well um, there's no shortage of things you can give them it's really just limited by your own um, imagination as much as i hate that that cliche um, that's what it is there's no shortage of things um, that they can do here but really yeah give them real tasks to do give them the resources and the support to do it um, and let them really run with that. 
Ooh, I love that. Um, you're giving me ideas right now. Thank you. Uh, so building off of Elena's question, Paula Zindi had asked, and I think this actually probably goes uh, dovetails nicely with what you were just saying. What are the best ways to encourage real community engagement beyond signing up? So I know that not everyone is going to be a founding member in that moment, but we're talking about like this real engagement and how you get people like actually who want to be invested, you give them ways to show their investment. Um, in chapter seven, keeping members engaged, you discuss the principles for asking popular questions. Will you walk us through those rules and how they serve community building? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, there's that a bunch laugh? of rules that we generally... <laughs> Oh, I just remember having a long discussion about it in Israel at, at an event there the other, the other week and really going into the precision of it, really into the weeds of it. Um, most people are nowhere near as good at starting a discussion as what they think they are, um, especially online. Um, and what you end up, if you look at a lot of the discussions in a community, you look at discussions with the title, can anybody help or I'm struggling or um, discussions that come off for sounding really, really fake. Like this where a brand is just trying to create a discussion to generate activity without really knowing um, what they're trying to achieve. So a couple of things we look at. One, if you want an answer, ask a question. Um, if you're using or treating your community like a notice board to post information, your members will treat it that way as well. You don't want that, I don't want that, your members don't want that at all. Two is be really specific as well. The more specific a question is, generally speaking, the more responses it gets. Um, so it's a lot better to be specific about the issue and not try and ask broad. It's tempting to ask broad questions that you think that everyone can answer. But what we found is that the more specific a question is, then and there's a slight limit at the end there, but the, the more specific a question is, the more responses it tends to get. Um, there's also multiple different types of, of discussions that you can use. There's open questions, there's closed questions. Um, there's questions that will facilitate bonding with one another. If I ask you what time it is and you tell me the time, that's a closed question. That's quite useful if you want to solicit a particular piece of information. Questions like, um, would you purchase this or that? Like the comparison ones, they tend to work quite well. Um, I think fundamentally though, questions should be about getting someone's experience and expertise rather than an opinion. Like opinions are interesting. I can give you my opinion on almost any topic imaginable, but it doesn't mean it's valuable to anyone else. What is valuable is experiences and opinions and sometimes resources as well. So it's one thing to say, um, hey, what's your favorite project management tool? It's another to say, what project management tool have, have you used? What, would you, what did you like about it? What did you not like about it? That kind of question tends to get a response. When you begin a question with something like, has anyone been able to do X? What did you find? That kind of resonates with someone because they get to put themselves forward to be like, yeah, I am, that has anyone answer. Um, so that tends to work well. Um, and the other thing is to create a emotional value for answering a question. Um, when people respond to a question, it's because they want to help. I mean, some people want to build a reputation or some people just want to cause havoc for sure. But the majority of us, when we give someone the time or we tell, or we give someone directions, we want to feel like we've helped. And we feel like we've helped when we see them going in the right direction or they make their train on time or whatever. And I think very often it helps when asking a question to disclose the emotional benefits of that question. Like when someone says, oh, I'm really struggling to do this. This is what I've tried so far. That I'm struggling is an emotional sig 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 signal that someone can help them. <coughs> um, so disclosing your emotional state and creating that emotional reward for answering um, really helps as well. And there's other tactics as well. Like you can tag in people that you want to answer. There's like, you can keep it a certain length. There's a lot of data we've seen on the right length for question, the right characters to use and all that. Uh, but that's getting a bit too in the weeds here, I think. I think one other thing, and forgive me if you did touch on this, uh, there's also, you talk about doing it at a steady cadence, right? Or making sure that there are questions yeah. around a steady cadence so it doesn't feel like super spiky and so that there's some sort of consistency with like, I, I think establishing expectations when someone's in that community, how often they might be asked or see a question or have opportunity to interact with a question. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of reluctant to give this advice because I gave it to someone about two, two years ago and they, they asked me like, how many discussions should we have? And for that size of the community, I said, well, about one discussion in a day is probably about right. And then they began thinking of it. This is the, this is the discussion on Monday. This is the discussion on Tuesday and Wednesday and they planned it all out in advance. 
And they created these discussions that came off sounding really inauthentic because they were discussions to fill a slot in the calendar on the day. What I mean by cadence of discussions, if your last discussion didn't get any responses, then you probably don't want to be creating five more um, until you got discussions to that one uh, question. And it could be that the question was wrong, you need to remove it and place it with a different question, a better one perhaps. Um, but it's more about just making sure that the, question, the number of questions that you're asking is matching the kinds of uh, responses that you're getting, the quantity of responses you're getting. Because if you get like a mixed match there, it's, um, yeah, it just becomes very apparent that the community doesn't, isn't working or isn't taking off or is trying too hard um, and doesn't really match the needs of the audience. Let's talk about some of those responses. So you also cover six elements to a fantastic community response. And I think, especially as more community tools are coming online, right? Um, there's and already tools that already exist. There's ways to look at community health, right? And a large part of that health is like, how responsive are people? Are people actually engaging with each other? How responsive is your own team? And being able to like make sure that people who are trying to interact, let's say with your brand, actually get to interact with your brand. Um, and so you talk about these six elements and uh, I won't I won't like take the cat out of the bag. You can talk about what those are. And then what I wanna ask around that is what should community leaders model in their responses? Like how, how do community leaders model this well? Yeah. Um... Can I share my share my screen? Is is is, is that, Ooh, that allowed? This has never happened before. Do you have the opportunity to? Can you press share? Screen? I'm gonna do it, and do you it. can kick me off it if you want. No, no, um, do it, do it. That's great. So, let me talk about Colleen Young, one of my favorite community professionals in the world today. Hopefully, you can see my screen. Okay. Yes. Can do. Um, if you look up any discussion that Colleen Young has made in the Mayo Clinic, Clinic uh, online community what you'll find is a template that looks like this. And this looks like a really simple thing. You don't need to know what the question is or any of those kind of things. But what's really remarkable is that there's a bunch of very specific things that she's doing in this community and in this response that makes it such an amazing response. One is that there's an app mentioned to the individual that asked the question. That's the first bit. So she thanked them for starting that discussion. Um, second, she's invited other people to respond to that discussion. Like that's a really remarkable thing to do because if you are at mentioned in a discussion, you feel like you have more expertise to share. She's realized it's not her job to answer every single question herself. It's her job to facilitate the discussions between each other. Three, she's also tried to provide like useful advice as well. And she's asking for a follow-up response. So she's done this at speed. She's done it well. She's, there's clear empathy in here. It's clear that she's... Um, it's clear um, that she's engaging others and she's doing all the things we want someone to do. And it's not that difficult to do this, to be honest, but it's very hard to do it consistently. And she's done it it's around like 10,000 times over the last couple of years. And so when we talk about what a great response looks like, we're not talking about a huge amount of work. We're talking about getting a couple of very basic things in place. I'll stop sharing my screen now. <laughs> So we talk about getting a very quick response to a, a, a discussion. We talk about response that is personalized to that individual. So they know it's not a template or pro forma response you give to every single per person. We talk about response that's friendly, that shows empathy for that person. We talk about response that conveys knowledge, the information that they need. Like you can share a link, but it's better just if you give them an answer. We talk about response that uh, facilitates a sense of connection. So you're connecting members to each other and ideally a response that resolves the issue the member has, or at least ask for a follow-up so they can participate again. Again, this isn't that hard to do. Once you know what these things are, this isn't that hard to do. And what's remarkable about Mayo Clinic and Colleen Young especially, is that since she's began doing this, the level of activity in the Mayo Clinic online community has skyrocketed. Like it's absolutely sky, sky, skyrocketed as a result. I mean, you can see a case study, I'll share the link here. But just by doing the basics incredibly well, you can drive a huge amount of activity. And one of the things that bugs me is that there's so much evidence that this works. There's so much evidence that this drives a lot more responses and engagement and participation. And far too often we ignore it because I, I feel like we either don't know or we don't take the time to do it. Um, but yeah, the results are incredible. It's very clear that um, it works. Um, so that's what I talk about when I talk about a fantastic response. It's, um, being at that level. Yeah, I love that. I was like, can you tell me about what community leaders should model in a great response? And you're like, I'll actually model what a community leader models in a response. 
the, the level of meta there, I really appreciate. That was also for screen share and like extremely um, powerful. So thank you. Um, all right, so oh, thanks, thanks to Elena and Paul, right? We've started a community from zero and we set it up for successful engagement. We have responses going in like um, thoughtful, consistent ways that bring other people into the conversation. So now Jay at Momo Board asked, what are the KPIs or metrics that you'd focus on for each stage of community growth? And in chapter 10, building your community strategy, you talk about building a facilitative, collaborative community strategy document in step with stakeholders, like very much emphasis on in step with, not just like delivering a doc and then being like, this will be so. Um, that includes plans for short, immediate, and long terms. And then you also talk about measurement based on the plan you set and give an example that highlights three different goals. Um, and you talk about like very specific goals here. And so like into in in your specific example in the book, um, which you know are like resolve 25% of customer query queries by the community, increase customer satisfaction score by community members by 15%, and get five customer insights gathered and validated by the product development team. So you're really trying to give like real goals that you could measure against different stages of the community. Um, do you think some of those goals apply quite broadly to communities in a way that they'd be useful for others to try on as a starting point? Or how do you help communities think about how they should set their goals or their KPIs for that short, long and immediate, short, immediate and long term um, to see where their impact is really yeah. like having an effect? Here's a funny thing I've, I've discovered about the book and other work I've done is that if you give people an example and you tell them it's an example, they will use it for themselves. Um, and I've I seen that happen that. so bad. often. No, I mean, like when I said, you know, it was all 25% of customer queries, I can't remember what the metrics were, um, but if, if that was it, five customer insights, I've seen that used in strategies from some of our clients before they hire us. And for me, I'm like, I made that up on the spot as an example. It wasn't based upon like anything else. It was just a theoretical example. It wasn't something anyone was supposed to use. Um, so let me try to talk about KPIs, um, yeah, a, a very specific way here. Um, it all goes back to the why. When you're creating an idea for a community, you should also know what you expect to achieve and how you will know you've achieved it. That's like your big high level goal, your ROI goal, your return investment goal. Um, you should have a metric you're tracking for that. I'm not gonna give you an example of what that number is, but you should have a metric that you're tracking that reflects your goal. It doesn't have to be um, a percentage. It doesn't have to be like a specific ROI, um, like a dollar value goal, but it might be a percentage of calls that are deflected. It might be the number of um, um, shared collaborations that come out of a community. It could be the number of people helped, um, but you should have a metric that matters most to the people you're working with that reflects um, your, your ultimate goal. Beneath that, you'll have a certain level of sub, and this could be more than one goal. So when I talk about resolving customer queries, improving satisfaction on insights, um, you can have more, more than one goal, but you need at least one to begin with. <clears throat> Below that, you have generally a set of KPI goals that reflects the health of a community. And usually you need to achieve these goals to get the end, the end result. And it varies, but often this is the number of active members that are participating each month, the number of posts that are participating each month, um, the number of mem members that are engaged um, in the community, the response rate, the time to first response, um, the satisfaction rate. Um, things like that are generally common, but it depends very much upon what platform you're using. Um, but at the very least, you should have the number of um, active members, the number of posts, you should have some basic engagement data that's worth tracking. Um, and then it's good to have some metrics that will let you track um, what's working, what's not working. Very often when we work with a community and we try to figure out what's wrong, we look at the, at the ratios. So how many people that visit a community join? How many that join continue to participate? How many that continue to participate become top members? And if something changes in those ratios, we know we're either doing some, something well or there's a problem we have to solve. And solving that problem in a data-driven way is a really, I mean, for some people it's really boring. For me, it's really exciting. Um, and so really understanding that um, helps a lot. So um, let me just go back to the question. It's a long one. Do some of these goals apply quite broadly to a community? Um, I think decide your why first and then figure out in a metric sense um, what number would be different if you achieve your goal. That's what you're tracking. 
Um, I can't tell you exactly what it is, but there should be a very clear metric that you're uh, tracking for that. And then, yeah, I'd probably look at the number of active members, um, the number of posts and things like that. Um, I can share more information about that if you want, but that's a pretty good overview, I think. And like, um, and like, uh, like if, if you get the book as well, there's lots of data, conversion rates, typ typical things that I would aim for. Um, but when it comes to goals, set the metrics yourself. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I, I want to give a PSA here. Um, I actually like italicized it for myself because in your book, right, you lay out your thinking in like really accessible ways and there are tables printed. And I would definitely say like, Hey, use those tables as like, a, Oh, here's a way to think through these things, but then don't use your words in that table, make that a blank table and say, how does this apply to my community? But structuring it in, let's say a tabular way, like helps, I think, see relationships and understand which buckets fall under what. Um, and then you make those tables and graphs and um, not necessarily graphs, but worksheets essentially available through Feverbee. So I highly recommend people checking them out, um, which Feverbee, you founded, not co-founded, founded. I got that. Um, <laughs> so Jay also asked, with those KPIs in mind, what are the features you'd request if you were building an ideal community software solution? So I think this takes us full circle to the beginning of our conversation when we were discussing building a home. Um, and then back to chapter three, you talk about turning use cases into technology requirements. Um, so what you encourage approaching as programming a dumb robot is how you said it. Um, what are some of those key use cases and how can folks turn those use cases into specs or, or what types of, you know, um, software, ideal software solution would be able to help you do that? Is there a panacea? And I think I know the answer to this right now, but, uh, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you take that. So my question to Jay here is that I can change two words of this and, and the question, and you understand my mindset is what are the features you would request if you were building an ideal car? Um, and suddenly you're like, wait, what's an ideal car? I mean, there is no ideal car. It all, it all depends upon what your needs are and what you want. And community platforms are completely the same. Like any technology is the same, I think. Um, there is no ideal solution. It's more about what is solution that makes sense to you and your members. Um, so if you're building a community platform from scratch, then that's a whole other, other set of issues. Um, but typically what we're looking for here are discussion forums or some way that members engage with one another that works extreme, extremely well. Um, but a lot of the features of community platforms today are relatively similar to one another. I mean, one might have this feature and some might not have a digest, some might have slightly better groups. Um, but when we think about community platforms, it's all about the broader package. Um, what I would say before selecting a platform is to really get feedback from other people using the platform that you've found yourself. So a platform vendor will always say, oh, you can speak to this person, this person, and that person. And they're going to say nice things about the, about the platform and you get to tick the box that you did the um, reference check. It's a lot more interesting to find your own ref references. The way we think about platforms in the IFP phase, and if you go to the link I posted here, you can see um, and a, what that looks like, is that first you figure out what members want to do. So members might want to have discussions with one another or exchange advice with one another. They might want to find the best advice. Um, and so then you turn it into a use case. So when someone visits that community, what are they going to do? Well, they're going to create a discussion. They're going to ask a question. They're going to um, they're going to use a search bar, and then you can start really specifying what technologies you need based upon that, and you can prioritize that as well. So for this, there's a lot um, of I can say here, but if you get the template of the IFP one, it will walk you through it, and it will save both of us a lot of time really. But I think it helps to begin with a template initially and then adapt it to suit your specific situation. And you can see how use cases are turned into needs and, pri and, pri and prioritized. Um, yeah. Awesome. Well, we have one more question um, from Francois that was just submitted yesterday. So while I ask this one, also invite our attendees here. We are holding this next eight minutes for space for live Q&A with Richard. Um, so while you're sharing your questions in the chat, um, or I'll get those from Stephen as well. Um, Francois had asked, uh, most community platforms are fairly similar. So going on with this platform thread, um, there's forums, libraries, blogs, shop board, et cetera. Um, what are the unique differentiations or tools or culture 
that you believe communities can make to truly stand out. And I think a lot of what you've said today has already covered that, but perhaps you have a specific example of um, a moment that you thought was like truly spectacularly stand out, stand outable, um, or something else that you'd want to uh, that you'd want to cover there in terms of like differentiation of a community. Yeah, I mean, feature wise, you're limited by what your platform offers. Like for vendors, I think the way they're competing now on um, services, on integration, and things like that. Um, so if that's great for you, then you can pick the one that does that best. If it's not, then don't. Um, <clears throat> In terms of the communities themselves, if you can customize and do whatever you want, <coughs> sorry, um, then go nuts with it. Um, there's no reason why a community in this day and age has to be based around that discussion forum. Like you can have a wall of activity, you can have people sharing photos and images of one another. Kaggle, the example of the data scientist community I used initially, didn't have a discussion forum for several years. Um, they had members sharing data sets with one another, participating in competitions and challenges. Um, so you can design a really exciting community experience that doesn't have to be based around someone asking a question and someone answering it. You can design an experience around people sharing files with one another. I mean, that might be a bit extreme, but like sharing files with one another or sharing stories or posting field reports of what they've done or a work in progress-based community where people sharing early designs and getting, feed getting feedback. There's such an infinite number of opportunities. The challenge with platform vendors today is that they're trying to create one version of the product and then sell it to as many people as possible. That's their model. And that's that, that, that should be their model. But if you've got the ability to create an experience yourself, then go nuts with it. Like really like figure out what is the most extreme, exciting thing that you could do and do it. Mm. Amazing. Thank you. Um, Okay, Angelica asked, how do we make new users with less knowledge about our community topic feel welcome within the already established member group? I love this question. Yeah, I think there's two parts of this. One is that you've got to tell your current members to, to be nice. Like Wikipedia had this issue a lot. Stack Overflow still has this issue where they attack newcomers for asking like dumb, dumb questions. And that's a really, I mean, also, Someone might ask a question and they might get a response like Re read the manual and or like um, or like this question has 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 been asked before. And that's not helpful because you don't know the question has been asked before and you might not even know how to search for the right terms to find the answer to like that question. And it's it's not practical for someone to browse through every discussion on that topic to find the answer they want when they can ask a question. So getting the basics right and making sure you have veterans that want to help or um, top members that want to help, really important, really critical to have that. The second part of this is to make a newcomer feel like they can be useful. The challenge with, new, with newcomers and the reason why most people don't participate in most communities out there is that they don't think they have anything to share. And the way you change that is by telling them that questions are as important as answers. Like often I send out a message like, we've got lots of top members waiting for questions to answer. Do you have anything you could answer? We need your questions in the community. Um, and even if it's your very first day in that topic, you know what it's like to be completely new. You know what it's like uh, to be new and you, you know what kind of questions that you can ask. And if you ask those questions, that's going to help the person that comes after you and so on and so, so forth. So I think the real challenge isn't to make newcomers feel smart, but to feel like their contributions can be useful because the community needs good questions. I think if you get that in place, that is such a big win. Not easy to do. You have to think about how you're going to communicate that in a persuasive and powerful way. But if you get, right, if you get that right, that's such a powerful thing to do. Yeah, and I think certain of the or a lot of the things that you showed from Colleen Young even apply here too, right? Like you bring in other oh, people sure. who are veterans in the community. You say like, hey, maybe you could help this person. Then you also say, thank you for that question. I acknowledge it. And this is helpful for other people. Um, so I, yeah, thank you for sharing two buckets. Um, looks like the last question from Erica Young. Uh, oh, I like, I like this one. What considerations should organizations consider around building community functions internally versus hiring consultants like Feverby? Hire us and spend as much money as possible. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it's an interesting question. We don't often get a question like this, so I'm not prepared for it. What considerations should organizers consider around building? Okay, so let's talk about what consultants, and I don't mean me, I, I mean just generally, what consultants can and can't, and can't do well. Because there's a cliche that 
you hire a consultant to tell you what you wanted them to say, and then they say it, and then you use that outside opinion to do whatever you want to do. <coughs> I, and I think most consultants have no interest in doing that whatsoever. I think where consultants do really well is that they stop you from making uh, mistakes. So for example, we've worked with 300 organizations now, and there's so many times I see an organization launch a community and I'm like, that's not going to work because there's a bunch of mistakes that are easy to fix if they had the right knowledge in the first place. So what consultants can do is bring a unique level of domain expertise, that wide angle lens, and to really help you avoid making mistakes. I think that can really help. Two is that consultants can speed up the process significantly of developing a community. Very often when you start a community, it takes a long time to do the, I mean, a lot, a lot of people don't do any, any, any research at all. So what we do when we launch a community, we really interview, I think, several dozen members of the audience. We talk to different members of the, of the state, of the state, of the stakeholders in the organization to make sure we have the right goals, make sure that we know exactly what members want. And the reason we never launch a ghost town pretty much ever the, the, these days is because that research we've done supports exactly what we're going to do. And it takes time. It takes time to write the strategy. It takes time to do all these interviews and calls. <laughs> it takes time to bring alignment around everyone as well, around everyone involved to get that right. So consultants can do that incredibly well. Um, third is you get that guide. Like um, I think the final plank of what we do is train people to manage communities extremely well. So for example, that Colleen Young example, Colleen took 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 our course in 2016, you know, and you can see the results of that. You can see the examples and the case studies and all that. Um, a lot of people managing communities have had to learn on the job and they've never been officially trained. So the basic principles of psychology and how to increase engagement and get more activity, that's not in place. So I think internally, what you should have is someone dedicated full-time to managing that community. I think if you don't have that, you could hire for that, but I usually wouldn't recommend it. I think where consultants can help is to accelerate your progress Make sure you don't make a lot of um, the obvious mistakes and then to provide you with that playbook and the resources and the training and the skills you need to succeed. I think that's probably where any consultant um, that's worth their school can do a great job there. Richard, thank you for that um, overview and for it being like candid and honest, right? Because obviously you are a consultant, but you're like, hey, here's what we can do and here's what we're not going to be able to do for you. <laughs> Um, but really, it's like Thank you're you. going to be able to set people up for success and set that foundation so that when you leave as a consultancy, they can continue to do that work and grow upon it. Um, or that's a very distilled answer. You gave a better one. Um, so that's it. Thank you for answering all of our questions and then questions on the fly, especially questions that you maybe haven't gotten before or too often. And <laughs> um, we'll yeah, really absolutely. appreciate it. And. Do you have any questions for us before we um, say thank you to our attendees? Thank you to Stephen and Zara behind the scenes. Thank you to you. Is there anything that we can answer for you? No, I've got to jump on another, another, another <laughs> You're like, in just busy. a second. But I do want to say, if I get some last words, thank you so much, everyone, for listening. I really appreciate um, really appreciate it. And your questions have been great and very different from the questions that I get quite often. Uh, and if you want to learn more about me, go to feverbee.com. Feverbee.com, founded by Richard. He's been doing a lot of work with it for over a decade. And um, if you want to continue the conversation, we are in the events channel in our Uncommon Slack, commonroom.io slash uncommon. You can join Slack there if you haven't yet. And then we'll be posting and sharing this video with Richard um, shortly. So thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Richard. What a joy to see you. Thank you so much.